Hello. Kita bom? Uh, eu, I'm, I'm going to start in Portuguese and then I'll move to English, ok? Então, boa tarde a todos, bem-vindos a mais uma palestra conjunta das sete seminários do Instituto de Computação, coordenada pelo querido professor Tomás Kowaltowski, e também mais um seminário dentro do CEPID, CCES, com financiamento da FAPESP, na área de boas práticas e gestão de dados. Meu nome é Cláudia Bowser Medeiros, sou professora do Instituto de Computação. And now I have the pleasure of presenting. Oh, oh, wrong glasses of presenting. So now I cannot read and this is going live online. Um, I have the pleasure of presenting Lee Wilson from Portage Network Canada. Uh, whose job, and he'll explain it a little bit to you, is all about managing uh, open research data and setting up the appropriate infrastructure for open science, open research. Lee has a very interesting trajectory, scientific trajectory. He's worked in all kinds of projects, including marine biology, social sciences, and now he leads a big group on uh, publishing and sharing open research data. So, Lee, thank you very much for, for coming in. The microphone is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, so, thank you, Claudia, for that uh, introduction, and thank you so much for inviting me to be here to speak with you today. Uh, and thank you to FAPES for funding, uh, funding my travel uh, to visit uh, this uh, Excellent University and Sao Paulo. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Uh, not so much. Not so much? Yeah. Well, like this? Yeah. 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 Right, okay, so uh, my name is Lee Wilson. I'm the service manager uh, for the Portage Network. Um, and I'd like to talk to you a little bit today about the work that I do in research data management. Um, so how many people in the audience are familiar with, with RDM, or research data management? <laughs> Perfect. All right, so I'm going to start with an introduction on what research data management is, uh, sort of what we think about when we talk about research data, um, and then some of the major trends that are going on right now in the field, uh, some of the drivers towards data publishing, towards open science, transparency, things of that nature, uh, some of the challenges and barriers that we're facing in the field, and then some of the work that we're doing uh, in Canada to try to help researchers uh, to navigate this uh, new and emerging field. So, first off, what is research data management? This is really a broad term, um, and it's used to describe a suite of activities about the organization, management, structure, and stewardship of research data. And it's commonly thought uh, to follow along what we call the research data life cycle. So this is a model behind me of the research data life cycle. And the idea is that the activities associated with research data management never occurs sort of just in one place. It's sort of an active process that moves all along the research phase, starting from when you're coming up with your research idea, starting to collect some initial evidence and analysis. Maybe you're starting to write your, your grants or your project proposals. And that moves on through to data collection, data analysis, uh, data sharing internally with your colleagues uh, or with colleagues at other universities. And finally, towards the end of your project, when you're starting to put together your papers, your publications, your final results. And now you're going to start thinking about how you're going to share out the actual research data that you've collected um, throughout your project. Uh, and so sharing that data is about uh, putting it into an archive where it can be accessed by other researchers, potentially, or se um, stored securely, and also discovered by other researchers through search. And finally, you can see that the data life cycle, as the name suggests, very much goes, is quite cyclical. And the idea is that um, other researchers could find your research data uh, when they're starting to pose their own questions uh, and perhaps use it as sort of a foundation upon which to conduct their own research so that you're not going back and collecting the same data over and over and over again. So I've said this term a few times now. Um, yeah, that's okay. Uh, so what, what do I mean when I say research data? 
Uh, so in general, what I mean are the kind of primary sources, right, uh, for, your, for your research projects. So these are the evidence that you're going to collect that will support your findings or conclusions. And they can come in many different forms and formats, of course, you know, uh, depending on the kind of work that you're doing. It could be tabular data. Uh, it could be images. It could be videos streaming in. It could be transcripts from surveys that you're doing uh, or interviews. Uh, so it comes in many, many different forms. Uh, and in addition to sort of the raw data or the raw evidence, we also think about data as being more than just data. It's everything that kind of goes along with it to help a, a third party or sort of another researcher or anyone else understand what went into creating the data so that they might use it for themselves. So it's things like the descriptions associated with the data, the metadata, um, it could be the methodology used to collect it. It could be things like the instrument calibration uh, that was used at the time of the data collection. All of these things that someone will need to go in and understand where your data came from, have confidence that they can, that they're quality and that they can use them for their own research. So why is it important, research data management? Well, it's important for a variety of reasons. Uh, it's sort of a hot topic right now. It's very much in the news quite a bit. Uh, and I'll start with an example that's very Canadian. Uh, so in Canada, we have a radio program uh, called Spark on CBC. Uh, and Spark looks at the intersection between uh, humans, society, technology, uh, and, and technology. And so uh, the, one of the episodes featured uh, researchers in Canada who are tracking caribou herds using remote collars. Uh, and work like this has been done in the past when you get sort of simple data, perhaps GIS type information, uh, but now these callers are able to capture a whole wide range of research data that weren't available before. So it's capturing GIS or sort of mapping information with the movement of the herds. It's also now capturing uh, vital signs of the animals themselves. Uh, it's capturing audio and video bursts. So the amount of data streaming in from these callers is so rich that it's not really an issue for the researchers to that they you know don't have enough data to kind of explore the questions of the research, it's that they have so much data that it's really become a data management challenge, right? They have so much data that they're not capable necessarily or able to uh, manage it all and get it in such a way that they can actually perform their analysis. And the batteries on the fritz. Um, so also in the news are high profile data losses. So uh, this is a, um, a story that came out of the United States where uh, NASA had collected, of course, uh, reams of data uh, in, associated with its uh, moon missions, its Apollo missions. Uh, and part of those data files had to do with uh, scans of the temperature uh, on the moon when they traveled there. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, at some point, due to an archival blunder, is what they say, um, the... Uh, these tapes were lost. So hundreds of these magnetic tapes with valuable data uh, were lost almost 40 years ago. Uh, and so what happened was they're discovering, looking at the data that they do have, that the temperature on the moon seems to be rising for some reason, very similar to what we're seeing with global warming here on Earth. Um, but they didn't have the, the raw data anymore because it wasn't well managed, wasn't well stored. Uh, and so they weren't able to actually go back and look at the data they collected to see if this was some sort of error, some sort of mistake, or if indeed the moon was in fact warming. Uh, so in this case, they were able to recover the data through an expensive and uh, lengthy process. Uh, and indeed, it proved that due to the activities on the moon, it is actually warming, and it is because of uh, human activities. Uh, but again, none of this, it, this was made much more difficult because the data itself wasn't well stored to begin with. Uh, we're also starting to see the value of research data beyond disciplinary boundaries. Uh, so this is an interesting article that uh, you could look at after this talk. Uh, it's linked there at the bottom. And it's talking about the five sort of weird archives uh, that scientists are now using to study past climates. So we all know that you know things like tree rings and ice, uh, ice cores and cave formations can tell us something about what the climate of the Earth was like in, in the past. Uh, but they're also finding that things like whale earwax, bat poop, and sediment from Roman aqueducts can also uh, tell similar stories. Uh, and what this really drives home, I think, 
is the idea that we don't know what the data that we're collecting today could be used for tomorrow. And scientists are excellent, but they are notoriously bad predictors of the value of their data to other people. I hear so much, so often, oh, no, 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 we don't need to say that. No one cares about that. Maybe two people on Earth. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Uh, but really, they have no idea what someone might be able to take their data and do uh, for it, using it for a different purpose for another study. And of course, uh, data is used, obviously, to verify research results. So there's been a lot of high-profile cases uh, in the news about uh, fraudulent research, um, people who are exaggerating or, or sort of fudging the claims that they're making. Uh, and unless you have the raw data available, it's really hard to reproduce the study uh, to show that, in fact, uh, there was some academic malfeasance or something else uh, involved. Uh, so it's really important that we um, have this research data available for things like replication studies. And there's also a commercial interest now in research data management. Uh, so I represent uh, a national library organization, uh, and we're really interested in exploring how we can work with librarians at our institutions uh, to deliver these services to researchers for free, but at the same time, many of the major publishers, so you can see here Elsevier, Springer Nature, all of these groups are coming out now with their own suite of research data services. And you can see that they have a long list of things that they're claiming to do, and these are often things that you'll find on many campuses librarians are, are offering. Uh, and so one of our researchers in Canada had this to say, is that sure they're solving some RDM problems, but really they're solving the easy problems and they're charging us for it. Uh, 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 you better say what RDM is. Okay, okay. I think I have. Oh, yeah. okay. But thank you. <laughs> if you could save your questions to the end. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Talk about RDM. <laughs> yeah, so they're, they're solving these things for a fee. And uh, in the library world, we've been working with publishers for a long time. And as, if many of you have worked, uh, published your own papers or are working with research projects, you'll know that it's a costly endeavor and we pay these publishers to publish our research and then we pay to get access again to the research. And that could be the same with data, is where we're going to pay them to take our data and then we're going to pay them again to get it back, uh, which I don't think is an optimal state. And finally, funding agencies all over the world are starting to require this. So in Canada, we have the Canadian tri-agencies, so that's three separate agencies that fund social science and humanities, engineering and natural sciences, as well as health sciences. And we are admittedly playing catch up at this point. We're by no means the first country to be coming out with a research data management policy, but we are coming out with one, which is good. Uh, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, but these sort of funding agency requirements are a really strong driver uh, towards RDM, uh, because it's something that, particularly if you're working in an international context, you may be required to do. So other drivers include things like trends in journal publishing. So if you're publishing in a lot of journals, for example, Science, Nature, both of these major journals now require that you submit the data alongside your manuscript. Um, and, there's a, and it also corresponds to a global movement towards open science and greater transparency in science. Uh, and as I mentioned before, international initiatives and best practices. So if you're going to be working, and I think I suspect you will, increasingly with researchers that are not only on your own institution, uh, but perhaps uh, in other institutions, in other states, in other countries, you're going to have to be able to understand and conform with the best practices going on internationally. So finally, where do I fit in all this, and what are we doing in Canada? Uh, so as I said, I'm the service manager for the Portage Network. We are a library-funded initiative uh, by the Canadian Association of Research Libraries. So this is a group, uh, this is an organization that's sponsored by uh, the top 15 research producing universities in Canada. Um, and we and the, we at the Portage Network are responsible uh, for the research data management development. So things like working collaboratively, collaboratively with stakeholders uh, to build shared services, to build capacity, and just uh, generally uh, better coordinate around RDM activities in Canada. So a little bit about the origins of the Portage Network. Uh, so we started off in 2014 um, as something called Project ARC, uh, where if you're familiar with ARC as Advanced Research Computing, which is the acronym that's commonly used in my country 
It's an extremely confusing name, uh, and it only came about because it just happened to be the hotel where the meeting was being held. It was called Project Ark, uh, so that had to change. So in 2015, we uh, chose the name Portage. Uh, so Portage is uh, an ideal name for us because it's we're a national organization in Canada, and so our two official languages are French and English. Uh, so Portage is said the same in both and spelled the same in both languages. And if you're not familiar, it's the act of carrying a canoe uh, from sort of one body of water over the ground to another, often on your back like this. So it has all kinds of rich metaphors along with it, of you know, tra traversing tough terrain and other things. So it was a really suitable name. Um, so we started in 2015 very small, and we still are to this day very small. So it, it consists primarily of a, a, a director, a service manager, and some project officers. Uh, so a very lean secretariat. Uh, but we've accomplished quite a bit over the past few years and are continuing to grow. And you can see here with these numbers uh, that a lot of the work that we do is driven by grassroots volunteers. Uh, and many of these are librarians working at academic institutions across the country. And you can see we started with just 15 volunteers in 2015, and we're now up to 115, and we're hoping to continue to grow. So unpacking the uh, previous slides a little bit. The goals of the Portage Network are to build a community of practice around RDM in Canada, uh, to engage and advocate for research data management among stakeholder communities, as well as facilitate and provide leadership in the development of RDM infrastructure. So what does that mean? So in terms of the community of practice, uh, the way we think about it is that at its core, we have what we call the network of experts. And as I said, so right now it's 115 members, spread across over 40 Canadian institutions. And these uh, mainly volunteers are working with the frontline staff at institutions. So these right now are pri primarily research data management specialists and librarians who are interested in advancing research data management in Canada. And at institutions, we work with a wide variety of partners, including liaison librarians. So these are kind of subject-specific librarians, IT spe specialists, uh, research university offices, including ethics, uh, as well as other stakeholders. And so who do we serve with this work? Well, of course, it's the researcher community. And in this context, it could be academic, it could be government, or other types of researchers. Mm -hmm. And this whole enterprise is supported by the infrastructure layer. So this is what allows us to sort of build the tools and platforms that I'll talk about today. Uh, and so in Canada, uh, our national inf uh, research Digital Research Infrastructure uh, is um, managed by an organization called Compute Canada, and so I'll talk a little bit more about them later on, uh, but we work very closely with this, this organization to provide some of these services. Uh, and we have things like the Data Management Planning Assistant, the Federated Research Data Repository, and the Dataverse Data Repositories. So uh, I've talked a bit about what this network of experts is, uh, and essentially it is 11 expert and working groups, again, all sort of grassroots uh, community uh, enterprises, uh, and these groups are meant to be exploring questions around sort of some of the biggest challenges we're facing right now in the field. So uh, there's sort of interest groups around things like data management planning, data curation, data discovery, preservation, training, and research intelligence. Uh, and we also have a number of working groups that are focused on uh, a variety of topics, including exploring the Dataverse repository, um, responsible management of sensitive research data. So of course, research data comes often with a variety of uh, potential ethical concerns, as well as privacy and copyright, uh, and also uh, some initiatives around our repositories. So it's a true network of experts. Like I said, 115 members spread across 40 Canadian institutions, and they've been very busy. Uh, so we produce a lot of documents and presentations. These can all be found, if you're interested, uh, in, in RDM on our website, the portagenetwork.ca. And we have a number of publications as well. So this list is constantly growing, and we'll keep updating it. Um, and it, these are uh, sort of white papers that take a look at the state of the field. They'll gather information of what's going on internationally, and they'll talk about what we want to do moving forward. Uh, and this is a really great vehicle for us at Portage to better understand what our community wants uh, in terms of building up these kinds of tools and services. Uh, so, for example, uh, there was a preservation white paper that was just published that talked about where the preservation community in Canada 
what's to go next in terms of in terms of uh, development. So the second goal of the Portage Network is to ad engage and advocate for research data management among our stakeholder communities. So this can be a really complicated field, um, and all the conversations that I've had this week show that this is not just the case in Canada, it's not just the case in Europe, as my colleague Ingrid was showing, uh, it's the case everywhere, that this is a uh, complex environment. So there are many, many stakeholders, and they are spread across sort of different contexts. In the local context, in general, this is at a university level, you'll have things like libraries, researchers, graduate studies, IT services, ethics boards, and research services. And you need to work among all of these groups and cooperate in order to uh, sort of hit all the aspects of research data management. But of course, it's not just local, it's also regional and provincial. Uh, so this is a, a map of Canada. Um, so here I'll be speaking to the Canadian context. Of course, the Brazilian context will be quite different. Um, but so in Canada, we have four very uh, large regional library consortia. Um, and these represent institutions in each of the sort of four regions of Canada. Um, of course, we have uh, many more provinces than just four, uh, but uh, th th these will be sort of groups of provinces together. Um, and so Portage has to, uh, works very closely with each of these groups. We have signed memorandums of understanding with all of the groups. Uh, and this is part of the community that needs to be consulted as we move forward. Um, and we also have national initiatives. So this one, it gets a little more complicated again, um, where we have a variety of players working at the national level, many of which also do have regional or provincial counterparts as well uh, to think about. Um, so here we've tried to just graph all the different organizations involved with digital research infrastructure in Canada, uh, from the users to those who kind of provide policy and direction, uh, to services and those who'd be providing frontline support. Uh, so Portage is there, uh, but we are just one of many and we all need to be working together. And so you can see that Portage sort of works across all of these groups uh, to make this uh, RDM services possible. So finally, uh, the third goal of the Portage network is to facilitate and provide leadership in the development of infrastructure. So one of the things we've done initially uh, as the Portage network is to focus on uh, the upcoming RDM policy. So working very closely with our funders uh, to make sure that um, what they're going to be asking researchers to do in order to comply with the policy uh, are met by the existing, uh, existing tools, services, and infrastructure available. So we have for the uh, upcoming uh, RDM policy, and this is still in draft form right now, but it is in a consultation phase, and we expect that the final uh, policy will look very similar to this. It's based on three main pillars. The first is that all institutions must have an institutional RDM strategy. Uh, and so for that, we've developed our RDM strategy template. All researchers who are funded by federal funding money must submit a data management plan. Uh, so we have our data management planning tool, uh, the DMP Assistant, which is a national online bilingual tool uh, for building data management uh, data management plans. Uh, and finally, uh, the third pillar is that researchers uh, are going to have to deposit research data that are associated with publications that were publicly funded. And so for this, we're developing two different repository services. So I'll unpack all of these now. Uh, so the first is the institutional RDM strategy. Uh, and so this was primarily, uh, this work was primarily done by our institutional RDM strategy working group. Uh, and the idea of the strategy is sort of uh, a first step. So it's recognizing that every institution is sort of at a different state with this, uh, the different levels of preparedness. Uh, and what the strategy allows you to do is assess sort of where you're at at your institution and starting to get together the correct people to have these conversations. Uh, so it's around things like raising awareness for RBM in your institution assessing your institutional read readiness, starting to think about how you might formalize some of these services and practices, and also defining a roadmap for moving forward. So we've developed a guide or a template uh, that's available on our website. Uh, and while it was created in the Canadian context, 
we believe it is generalizable and could be used uh, by other institutions and in other jurisdictions. So we also have uh, the data management planning requirement, and that was primarily the data management planning expert group, the training expert group, and the research intelligence expert group. Uh, and this is the product called the DMP Assistant, which is both a tool and a template. So a data management plan, um, for those who might not be aware, is essentially uh, a guide that walks a researcher through all of the major steps that they need to be thinking about along the, the research data life cycle in order to ensure that their data is well managed. So it asks questions primarily about things like data collection, documentation and metadata, backup and storage, preservation, what are you going to think about in terms of data sharing and reuse, who's going to be responsible for your data management plan, who is going, uh, what kind of resources will you require, uh, and also things like ethics and legal compliance in terms of your data. So it's a very comprehensive uh, tool and very useful uh, for all research, not just research that is uh, funded, um, funded or sort of required to have one, because it's a great exercise to sort of get you thinking from the outset about data management um, when you start your project. And so we have uh, the DMP Assistant, and the 2.0 is coming soon. Uh, so this is uh, just, uh, it's basically a combination of two very popular open source platforms. Uh, that have existed for a long time. They eventually got together and said, why do we have these two platforms? Wouldn't it make more sense if we had a shared code base? And so they did that. And it's called the DMP Roadmap, and that's what we'll be implementing in Canada. Uh, and it comes with a number of new features that we think are really exciting for our researchers. Um, so things like machine-actionable DMPs, which means that your data management plan, when you write it up and you export it in a nice Word document, you might also be able to export it in machine-readable formats so that it can go into other um, into other tools. So it could go into, for example, a data repository. It might go into your uh, national academic CV system or other places. So it's making it so that you don't need to do this work multiple times, manually typing out all of your uh, aspects of your research. Uh, another one that we're really exciting about, uh, excited about, is uh, supporting researchers' abilities to opt in uh, to share their data management plans. So one of the questions I get a lot when I'm working with researchers on DMPs is, well, do you have an example of someone doing similar research as me uh, that I might be able to use as a basis for my own? Uh, and sadly, the answer is not really. Um, there are examples online, but there isn't a really great uh, repository for these kinds of things. And so we're hoping um, that we'll have some buy-in for this and researchers will be able to opt in to share their data management. Um, so in terms of uptake for the DMP assistant, um, we, it's been pretty good so far. We have over uh, 3,000 individual accounts and 37 institutional accounts. Uh, and one of the issues is, is a bit of a chicken and the egg situation uh, because there isn't yet sort of that mandate for it. Um, and so we've, we've sort of built the tool before the mandate. Um, but in order to have the mandate, you also need to have the tool available so that researchers can comply with it. Uh, so it's a bit tricky. Uh, you don't want to get too far out ahead of it, but um, uh, we, we uh, have seen fairly good uh, adoption so far, and we suspect that as the data management policy uh, comes into force, we're going to see more adoption. So uh, the th third pillar is the national repository options. Uh, and so this uh, was a very large initiative that involves most of our expert and working groups. Um, and so we have two options that we're working on and exploring in Canada. The first is the Federated Research Data Repository, and the second is the Dataverse Technology. So uh, for FERDER, um, it's a partnership between the libraries, so Portage and CARL, and Compute Canada, which is our national research infrastructure provider. Um, and it was created to help fill a gap in the ecosystem uh, primarily around uh, the upload and download of very large data sets. Um, and so we do this using a technology called Globus File Transfer with RID FTP. Um, and it's really nice because it's very easy for researchers to, in, to ingest and move around massive data files. Um, it also maintains file hierarchies, which is important when you're doing your research because a lot of time there's some rich metadata associated with how uh, you've organized and named your files. Uh, and so oftentimes, 
in order to put it to a repository, you need to archive it in some way, um, and which can lose some of this nice rich metadata. And so this allows you to just move the files directly over. Um, it's also a scalable technology. So we built this with the idea that um, in a national system, you're going to want something that can grow expansively over time. So you don't want a technology that just sort of has all of the you know, data sitting at one sort of back end. Uh, so Furter right now has, uh, is spread across multiple systems, uh, and it's quite easy for us to add more storage wherever that storage lives already. So for example, if an institution already has a large sort of um, uh, some uh, storage hardware purchased, uh, but they don't want to build or maintain or manage their own repository, they could uh, just plug it into Furter. Uh, so we're also a national discovery platform. Uh, so I'll talk about that more in a little bit. Uh, but the idea here was to create something that will make all of the Canadian research data searchable from a single portal. Uh, and we do that primarily through metadata harvesting. So I'll talk about that more in a moment. And it also has preservation processing capabilities. So further right now is in what we call limited production. Uh, so that means that groups can go on our website, frdr.ca. They can search for Canadian data. They can download it, use it. And we're working with a select number of research groups uh, to actually ingest their data while we test our operational workflows. So the strategic relevance of Furter is that it fits into our broader vision for preservation. Um, so one of the things we do with data files as they come in, and you'll see this more in a diagram later on, is actually uh, ingest the data files and then transform them into file formats that archivists believe are going to be usable into the future. So for example, if you're submitting a Microsoft Word document or something like that, that can only be opened by Microsoft Word. Um, this is going to transform it into something more neutral, like a text file or a PDF file, that we think will be open for, you'll be able to open on a computer 25 years from now. Of course, there are no guarantees. <laughs> uh, but this is one of the ideas. Um, so, and again, I'll talk about this more later on, but we think that these sort of medium range repositories probably won't be great for the long term storage, the 100 year storage of research data, uh, but they'll be good for the 20 year storage. So what we want to be able to do is use these as a sort of gateway or entry point for research data, um, do these transformations, and then deliver that information package uh, to archives for long term storage. It also fills a strategic partnership with Compute Canada and ARC. Um, so we found working uh, with our national infrastructure providers has been uh, excellent in terms of being able to build these kinds of tools that can scale to a national level. And it's also filling key gaps within the RDM ecosystem around large data. So here's just some of the groups in Canada that we're working with. We're trying to work with uh, groups of all shapes and sizes and different disciplines. Uh, so we have archaeologists that are uh, working, uh, working in Africa. Uh, we've got... Uh, big water groups that span different institutions across Canada, um, and we've got uh, uh, projects that have sort of taken, uh, well, this one called the Mountain Legacy Project, where they looked at uh, surveys that were actually done around the turn of the century um, and were photographed all across the Canadian Rockies and stored in our national archives as these sort of glass plates with all the photographs. So they've taken those, they've digitized them, and then they've gone out and redone the exact same surveys, trying to take the exact same photos, and they're able to match up how things have changed over time. Uh, and so this is a great project that we're working with. They have an excellent web portal, the Mount Legacy Project Online. But these kinds of projects don't last forever, which is why it's so important to actually have a repository that can store this really valuable research over the long term. Um, so these are just a sampling of some of the groups that we're working with. And the other uh, major repository uh, option that we're exploring in Canada is Dataverse. So I don't know if you've heard of this, but it was talked quite a bit about yesterday. Uh, so Dataverse was a repository that was developed at Harvard initially. It's open source. It has a very large uh, global following. Um, it's a mature platform. Uh, and it's really easy to use, very user friendly. It was developed first for work with social science and helping to describe that kinds of data. Uh, but it's really expanded well beyond that now. Um, it's very brandable, which means a university can just take this platform, add a lot of their own branding, make it look very similar to the rest of their uh, websites and other, uh, other web offerings. 
Uh, and so we want to see this in Canada as a possible national repository option as well. Uh, and that's because Dataverse is in wide use across Canada. So here's just an example of some of the ones we have in Canada. These are just in Ontario, managed by Ogle Scholars Portal. Um, and then there's also a variety of other Dataverses in existence. Um, so a lot of different Dataverses. Um, and what we want to see is, are these groups sort of working together to potentially, and this is something we're just exploring, have a national Dataverse platform. Uh, because one of the problems where is, is if each university is going out and sort of standing up their own instance of a repository, um, very quickly what you'll find is that even if they're all using the same technology, uh, new versions of that technology come out all the time. And it can be very expensive and difficult to try to upgrade. Uh, so you'll find that if you have people with different instances, soon you're all going to be on different versions. And eventually those versions don't play well or talk well with one another. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we're really doing a push right now. We have a, a working group called Dataverse North. It's essentially a community practice uh, of people who are enthusiastic about this repository, who are in, implementing it on their campuses, and who are developing for it. Uh, so one of the recommendations that came out of that group is that Canada should implement a nationally hosted instance uh, that can be used by other universities. So that work is, is well underway right now. So one of the questions we do get asked a lot uh, is sort of why do you have Photo and Dataverse? Why do you need two? And the reason really is that it's a multi-pronged approach. So research data management is a very complicated field, right? If you're thinking about managing all research data, if you unpack that a little bit, that's all of the disciplines, all of the different kinds of data you're going to encounter, very unlikely you'll find one solution that fits everyone. Even these two solutions won't fit everyone, as you'll see in a moment. There are other kinds of technologies that people are using that we need to be able to support. So you really do need a multi-pronged approach to these complex issues. Um, so uh, one of the reasons we do this is because it fits into our broader, federa broader federated model, which I'll talk about in the next slides. And it's also strengthening strategic partnerships. So for example, with Compute Canada, who we're working with to develop the further uh, repository, as well as Ogle Scholars Portal, who are, uh, who are hosting the major uh, Dataverse instance right now in Canada, as well as the Dataverse North community and other stakeholders. And it's also filling these key gaps in the RDM ecosystem. So just to, re, uh, to recap briefly, we have the Canadian Tri-Agency Policy. That policy has three main pillars, and the work that we're trying to do is to have solutions to each of those pillars so that we can give our funding agencies confidence to move forward and be bold with the research data management policy uh, so that um, researchers will sort of have the mandate to publish the research data um, and, and then we'll be able to, to serve their needs. So uh, you've heard me talk about federated architecture quite a bit. I'll unpack that now. Um, so for us, it kind of all starts at the research level. Obviously, this is at the institutional level. Here I have it represented with the four major library consortia across Canada. But this is, this is the work being done on the campuses every day. And in sort of library in terms, we call this active storage. So this is the stuff that you're producing when you're doing your research. Uh, it's the data that's coming in off your instruments. It's the data that you're inputting after you uh, finished a survey or conducted a survey. It's the transcript after you've typed up uh, after your interviews. Um, so there's a lot of it. It's really messy. It lives in so many different places, right? It might live on commercial cloud. It might live on your laptop. It might live on a jump drive that you stick in your drawer, all kinds of places. Um, and so what we are trying to do is uh, minimize the friction from moving between this active storage and what we call repository storage. So this is where you will take a subset, potentially, of that active data. When near the end of your project, and you'll want to preserve that because it supports the conclusions of the research that you've conducted. Uh, and the main way to do that right now is to think about this repository storage. So this isn't uh, really long term. This is around the medium term. So we think about 20 years. Uh, but compared to the active storage, which can be the duration of a project, it can be very ephemeral, it could be a year, uh, it's quite a bit longer. And the benefit of the repository storage is that as appropriate, 
the data itself is accessible to the researchers. So right now in Canada, this is a little bit what the landscape looks like. We have a variety of what we call discipline-specific repositories. So these are repositories that have been created by disciplines, um, maintained over many years. They are often very specialized, and they serve uh, a sort of a, they, they serve a dedicated community. Uh, and these are very important and very hard to, to reproduce in any other manner. We also have regional and institutional repositories, and then we have regional and institutional instances of Dataverse. Uh, now we also have the Federated Research Data Repository, uh, which can have a focus on very large data sets for both upload and, of course, download, because it's not just about getting the data there. You need to be able to take it back out. Um, but this landscape still isn't really what we were looking for, um, because as you can see here from up by sort of the blocks, uh, it's still quite silent. Uh, and so what we wanted to do was find a way to sort of move across all those silos to ensure that if I'm a researcher and I need data related to my field, I don't need to now go to 50 different locations to search. That's not what people do. Um, so what we've done is uh, we have a metadata harvester, which basically means that we just go uh, into repositories with a script and we uh, collect the records about the data. So the things to say, who collected it, what is it, uh, you know, where, where did it come from, all those kinds, where does it live now, all those kinds of things. And we make all those records discoverable in one search interface. So you can search further right now, and you'll find data based on your topic that lives in a repository over here, and you click and you're brought to that repository. Um, so it's still not sort of the ideal state, but it's what makes a lot of sense, because I think we... Uh, we're in a landscape where there will always be multiple repositories operating, uh, and one of the best ways to bring it all together is through this metadata harvesting and single search. So we call this the National Discovery Layer. Um, and then after that, we also have preservation processing and archival storage. So this one is a little bit scary because I think on the active and the repository storage, you can kind of wrap your head around all this pretty easily. Uh, 20 years, not long, isn't really that long. Uh, but archival storage, now you're talking of hundreds of years, which becomes a bit mind-boggling when you think about a medium that hasn't existed that long. Uh, and now we're going to think about storing it into hundreds of years. Who knows what we'll be using then? Uh, so this is, this is a scary part. Uh, so uh, some of the things that we're doing to help prepare for this in the library world are things like preservation processing. So there's tools. One of the tools that's pretty popular is called Archivematica, another open source tool. And it does that file transformation that I talked about earlier. So it'll take your Microsoft Word, it'll turn it into a PDF, it'll take your proprietary like, uh, stats, a stats format and move it into an open format as possible. And so those are called Archival Information Packages, or APES, which is a great acronym. And the APES then are moved into what we conceive of as a preservation storage, a network of preservation storage providers. Uh, so right now in Canada, this is a new concept. This was brought forward by a preservation expert group. Uh, it's something that we're just exploring. We think these preservation service providers are going to be either regional consortia or universities themselves. Because if you're thinking about these timescales, what things last hundreds of years? Well, universities tend to. Um, the, some, of them. some of them, yeah. The institution I come from, uh, Dalhousie, it just had its 200th birthday not too long ago. So we think that these are institutions that can kind of last uh, into those timescales. Um, but right now, this is work that we're sort of doing. So the way the landscape sort of looks now, we do have these repositories and we do have this national discovery layer. There's still a lot of work to be done. Uh, don't get us wrong, but this this does exist today, which is great. Um, this part is what we're kind of moving towards right now. Uh, so that'll be work that we'll be doing over the next few years. Uh, and this is just sort of another look. So you'll have these slides. This one's pretty dense, so I don't like to speak to it too much. But it talks more about what I meant when I say things like active storage, repository storage, and preservation storage. Uh, and it talks about the sort of different levels of open, openness that these things can be and sort of the ideal state for use. This one is a little more interesting, but again, very text heavy, so I don't like to lean on it too much. Uh, but it talks about what, you know, where, where these things live. So for active storage, it's institutional network drives, it could be your lab computer, 
high performance computing clusters, uh, what do we mean when we talk about repository storage, and then again, trying to show a sort of pipeline into uh, these long term archival storage. Uh, and of course, one of the things to think about too is as you move across each of these phases, uh, the price tends to go up. Mm -hmm. So for active storage, uh, yes, there's a lot more data, but it's a lot cheaper because maybe you'll wipe that data and you can reuse that storage again. Um, or maybe it doesn't really matter because, again, storage isn't really all that expensive and if it doesn't need to be kept alive and around for 20 years, that's even cheaper all again. Uh, moving into repository storage, now, well, you've got curators who you might hire that'll work with the research data, help describe it, uh, get it ready so that uh, it can be found by other researchers. That all costs money. Keeping the data for a long time in a secure location with geographic backups, that costs money. And now archival storage. You've got another set of curation that needs to be done. You've also got cyclical curation that needs to be done. Every X number of years, I need to take this data out of the deep freeze. I need to check it. I need to make sure it's not corrupt. I might need to run some transformations. I need to put it back in the freezer. Repeat that over hundreds of years, 100 years. That gets expensive. Uh, and your geo and the geo replication for archival storage is meant to be uh, sort of more robust as well. Um, and of course, one of the things we haven't talked about very much today are that there are so many activities that happen alongside the storage. So of course, you have data management planning that informs from the researcher perspective how they envision their research data to move. So I say, well, I'm collecting it today. It'll be kept in my lab server tomorrow, and then next week it's going to go into a repository. And then next year, I'll move it into the archive. Uh, and also data curation. So all along the way, you've got uh, librarians and other information professionals and data professionals working with the research data, adding metadata, adding more description, giving it more value, essentially. right? Because a one and a zero is nothing if you don't know the context of it, if you don't know what it means. So we've talked a lot about the work that we're doing in Canada. Um, and I've tried to relate that some of it is, is present and fact, and some of it is ideas and visions and future. Uh, but we have some concrete next steps that we're gonna be taking. Uh, so the first is we wanna do more developments in this active space. It's a tough one because it's messy, uh, and researchers are using all kinds of different tools. Uh, but we have some developments that we've uh, just received grant money for, um, where we're gonna be working with tools that researchers are already using to collaborate in their labs and try to do uh, make them sort of better purpose or fit for purpose uh, for describing the research data as you go so you don't do it near the end of your project. So it makes it really easy. Let's say you collect some data, you put it in. Um, this tool will also extract automatically some metadata based off of the file type or based off the instrument that it came from, uh, but it also gives you the option then and there to start describing it. Uh, and so you do that as you go, and by the time you get to the end of your project, you have a lot of data but it's already somewhat well described, which makes the curation work less. Um, so you have richer curation, and it's also ultimately less expensive. Uh, so that's work that we're, we're just getting started with now. Uh, we also want to look at options for a distributed curation network. Uh, so curation is it's often quite expensive, uh, and we have varying states of capacity across Canada. So some universities might have several people that are capable of doing this work, Others have none, others have a point one of one. Um, and I think we also recognize that it's such a broad topic and research itself is so diverse that no one institution will ever have all of the expertise you need to help everybody. So it really makes sense to share expertise as best you can. So what we want to do is create a sort of a community in Canada where curation expertise can be shared among the community. And if I'm a researcher, and British Columbia, that's all the way on the, the west coast of Canada, um, and I have a specialized need that can be served by someone sitting all the way on the east coast, that can happen. And we also want to do continued developments on our two repository platforms. Uh, so further and Dataverse, both of these are becoming more mature, more feature rich, and we also want to find better ways to integrate them. Uh, so we think right now it's great that we have this discovery service and everything's discoverable in one spot, uh, but we it's all about sort of reducing the friction for a researcher who needs to deposit their data. So it needs to be really clear when they come to our website, which repository they're going to, which one they're going to use, why they might use one over the other, all these kinds of things. And some of that is development work that needs to be done. 
And finally, and this one's exciting, so our discovery layer right now is sort of text search, so it's pretty much like a Google for data kind of thing. Um, but we're harvesting a lot of really rich geographic information, so GIS uh, metadata. Uh, and what we want to be able to do is have our users come in and actually search on a map interface, right? Because if, this, if they're interested in areas, if they're interested in maps, that's obviously how you should be searching. <laughs> uh, just by grabbing a map, a portion of a map, and then all the data associated with that will come up and you'll be able to dig into it from there. Uh, so that work also has been funded uh, and is just now getting underway. So I know that was a lot. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to take questions and uh, explain anything further. Thank you. Preguntas? Pode ser em português que a gente traduz. Big tech companies like Google, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, they hold huge amounts of data that of a variety of natures that are very useful for research. And also they provide expertise in infrastructure. So my question is, do you have any partnership in mind with these companies to regarding infrastructure of data? Yeah, uh, so that's a great question. Uh, Google actually, as you probably know, just came out with their own data search a few weeks ago. Um, so this is an initiative that we'll be working with closely. Uh, Google is really good at what it does, right? And what it does is provide great services broadly and globally. Um, so the trade-off to that is that while they're going to have a great catalog of data, uh, they probably won't have time to dig into all of the sort of niche scientific data repositories that exist all over the world um, that aren't easily accessible from, you know, sort of one major source. So the work we're going to have to keep doing at the, the local country <laughs> or sort of national level uh, is actually going and talking to these research groups, making sure that the repositories are in a state that can be harvested, doing that harvesting, and then working with Google to make sure that these small repositories are discoverable with Google. So kind of acting as an intermediate mm -hmm. uh, That's a great question. Mais perguntas? Ok, acho que é uma pergunta. Você não se sentiu para mim se os pesquisadores de outros países do mundo do Canadá podem usar o sistema de portagem? Sim, então, qualquer um pode usar. Oh, estou em câmera. Então, qualquer um pode usar para procurar e procurar dados de dados. So our mandate is to uh, harvest and bring together Canadian research data. That's a hard term, uh, but generally I guess it's research produced by Canadians or about Canada or in Canada, uh, but anyone can use it and download it. Um, in terms of actually storing data, that will only be working with Canadian research groups. I have another question. It isn't very clear to me Maybe you've already answered it, but there are a lot of agencies that hold massive amounts of data, like not only Google and these companies, but like the European Space Agency. They have a lot of data on satellite images, and this is also very useful for researchers. So do you plan on like producing metadata on these uh, like satellite images to provide information at least about the data and how to search and discover such data in your platform. Yeah, so uh, we uh, are also harvesting from government data portals, again, just in Canada, uh, but we have our Open Data Canada portal, uh, some StatsCan data, and now recently we are starting to expand our harvester to get at um, like municipalities in Canada. Many of them have their own data portals, which is great, rich local data. Uh, and also uh, provincial data portals as well. So the answer is yes, uh, as long, for us, as long as it's in a Canadian context. Um, yeah, some of those other, uh, uh, you know, larger uh, sort of groups, um, like the satellite data you're referring to, we have some of that as well in Canada, uh, you know, around oceanographic information, and it's constantly moving, right? It's, it's sort of a different 
conception of data as it's never just one fixed, nice object you can package up and store and search and find a landing page for. So that's, there's a lot of pioneering work that needs to be done in that area. Uh, I know one of our, our groups in Canada that does a lot of this oceanographic like data visualization and things like that, data products, uh, is looking into better ways for things like our system to be able to pick up on and um, show people uh, this kind of work being done. But it's hard because it's constantly changing and moving. So that's sort of the second part of your question, uh, something I think we're going to be working towards. Okay. I think Claudia wanted to make a few comments about what's yeah, being yeah. done here, right? Yeah. So to complement your presentation. Uh, yeah. Like Great. Okay, so I'm going, yeah, you pass the torch, I'll stay right by you. Uh, <laughs> thank you. There is a difference in level. There's, yeah. okay. <laughs> so, um, uh, we came to Brazil in the context of something that's been done in the, at the state of Sao Paulo, um, which is part of a big activity of all the seven public universities at the state of Sao Paulo to create a network. Oh my God, Lee. Yeah, oh, I wanted to you use know. one of your slides, but that's okay. Oh. Uh, no, but that's, well, I'll, I'll go after it. And uh, the idea is that uh, by the end of 2019, so it's like tomorrow, uh, the seven public universities of the state of Sao Paulo will be connected via a single metadata portal through which will be connected with the world. Like Portage is connecting Canadian produced research data to the rest of the world so that people will be able to more easily access all the research data of the projects that are being conducted here at the state and see where these data are. The difference, and, and you, I don't know your name, what's your name? Eric. Eric made a very good point and you also, Vincenzo, about uh, what about all the other, all these other data sources? Um, and uh, you really did also. You maybe you have some some examples of say enriched data or other kinds of data that are not for immediate public consumption, mm -hmm. but yet should be discoverable, right? So maybe afterwards, if you have a couple of examples, I don't know if you do. But uh, the thing is that it's impossible for these major companies to find and index everything in a way that it's findable by experts whose research needs the data, not the general public. Experts would want specific kinds of data and that needs specific metadata, okay? So what is being done here at the state of Sao Paulo is part of a two, let us say, two-leg uh, initiative, which has been prompted by FAPESP, which is the uh, Sao Paulo uh, funding agency. The first leg is that little by little, every project submitted to FAPESP will have to have a data management plan. This is already a valid for what we call big five-year projects, but by the end of next year, it will be extended to other projects. And the second thing is this uh, seven university uh, group, which was joined yesterday by Embrapa which is uh, the Embrapa here at Campinas, Embrapa Informatics. And we are building a, a core, a metadata core, and each university is building its own big repository 
and uh, two of the people responsible for building this infrastructure are, well, here, but you cannot see them. Thankfully, they are hiding uh, uh, beyond the visible uh, screen, but um, if the U Unicamp is building its university data repository from which metadata for research, okay? From which metadata will be exported to this portal and will be connected to the Canadian portal, the European science cloud, and everywhere else in the world. So um, this is what I wanted to say uh, at the moment. And this is why uh, we invited Lee because of his expertise and because we want to exchange experiences and uh, because Unicamp needs you. Where's the camera? <laughs> There's no cameraman. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> so this is the kind of, you know, advertisement. Unicamp needs you. Uh, if you are interested in this kind of work and you want to work towards data cleaning, data preservation, data storage, data indexing, metadata harvesting, exposing research that's been done anywhere here, or at the state of Sao Paulo, or anywhere in the world, so that people can work together. Talk to Lee, <laughs> which is better. Yeah, or, or talk to people here at Unicamp, or the University of Sao Paulo, or ITA, or UFSCA, or UNIFESP, UFABC. or UNESP, I'm sorry? UFABC. And UFABC. And Embrapa. And Embrapa, yeah, okay. And Embrapa as of last week. So, um, I don't know, um, I have I actually now have a question, so you have to come back. It's about, uh, I have two questions, it's about data preservation, mm -hmm. okay? And then you mentioned uh, putting data in the freezer, it, what does that mean? Do you actually freeze, <laughs> freeze data, you know, you congeal it, you put ice cubes, what, what, what do you do? And the second thing, um, data preservation is really a hard task, right? So could you elaborate a little bit more first on the ice cubes and then, <laughs> and then on the preservation? Thank you. Sure, thank you. Uh, so this is not my area of expertise, uh, data archiving yeah. is not my area, so please take this with a grain of salt. Um, no, unfortunately we don't put it in the freezer, although okay. that would be nice. Um, what I mean is... Uh, you're already in freezer. That's right, that's right, yeah. Dude, there, there needs to be a lot of climate control already yeah. in data centers. No, no, it's, uh, it's more that... Um, Even in Canada? Yeah. <laughs> we leave it out in a snowbank. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, it's that, so for a repository storage, you're going to want it on uh, the kind of storage hardware that's really easy for you to sort of upload to and also download to. So it's still quite accessible near-line access, um, whereas when you get into a, a, an archive, uh, maybe it's not so important that the moment I click the button, that yeah. data is, is going to be available to me. Um, I mean, you want mechanisms, I think, uh, still to be able to access the data at some point, uh, but what I mean by moving it to the deep freeze is that you're going to be moving it on to uh, formats, uh, so if, for example, for your backups, you might move it on to, rather than spinning disks, which are more expensive, tape, which is mm -hmm. cheaper, and then you'll kind of keep that tape offline. Mm. Uh, so again, cheaper again, not always connected. So that's sort of what I mean by putting it in. Oh, okay. Yeah. Ice cubes. Yeah, not, not on ice cubes, but I'm sure there's a, a cooling unit in there somewhere. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, so yeah, it's um, it's quite an intensive process. And again, not my, my area of expertise, but the idea is it's you have to constantly be revisiting this data. Um, we know that technology is going to change rapidly. Or continue to change rapidly over the next whatever, however many years. Uh, and so we as a community really have this challenge of how do I make sure that the research data I collect today can actually be in Earth 50 years later and that there's a machine that's still going to be able to run it. Uh, and there's a lot of work being done in this field on how you might do that. So a lot of things around kind of emulation, maybe if it's a computer program you just package up the entire 
software environment, uh, including the operating system and everything, and you put it in a box, and then that's what you store. And so when a researcher goes to use it, they basically, let's say they pull out an emulated version of Windows 95, and they can run the program. It's a really simple way to describe that. Um, so there's different techniques being used. Uh, we don't really have a great medium for lasting hundreds of years. Uh, constantly, you're going to have to be moving it on to newer, uh, newer mediums um, to avoid corruption, and taking it out, praising it, and, uh, and making transformations. So yeah, I'd say the preservation piece is one that not just sort of in Canada, but globally and as a field, we've got a lot of uh, a lot of thinking to do to figure out how we're going to make sure that this stuff remains useful and usable in the long term. Does that help? That, that yeah, yeah. Uh, Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> okay. There are no more questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. So that I gave that on a jump drive to uh, the new the new okay. yeah. Yeah. So, Very nice to meet you as well. Yeah. And uh, I'll be thinking of you guys as I eat the barbecue tonight. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to it. Okay. Uh, do you still have Claudia's pen drive, or you have it? Oh, there. Well, this one. Yeah. Okay. okay so I'll, I'll borrow it to you. Oh, you can, you can. I'll take it now and give it back to you. Okay. Is that okay? Sure. As long as you give it to me today. Today, yes. I'll try. No, because uh, I have to send the card. Okay. Yes, I know. But I want to put it on the... Yeah. I, I didn't know oh, this. I don't know. 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 So what kind of research are you doing? Uh, it's a uh, data set about the solving okay, second. It was nice meeting you. Thank very you very nice much. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak here today. Very interesting. No, yeah. Yeah. I don't do any of this part.